We're going to be looking this morning in John's Gospel at chapter 9, a familiar story that I think lines up well with Next Step Sunday. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, my daily Bible reading was in the Gospel of John, and I, I came through to this story, and I thought, oh, this is a great passage to reflect on uh, on a Sunday like Next Step Sunday, because in the story, we find all kinds of people making steps forward and steps backward in their life of following after Jesus. And of course, our goal for each of us this morning is that we find ways to take steps forward. If you're visiting with us this morning, this is a great Sunday to be here. Not only will you uh, have a chance to worship, not only will you have a chance to enjoy the meal afterwards, but you'll have a chance to at least be introduced to the diversity of ministry opportunities that are uh, created here at NPC and all of which uh, could afford you an opportunity to take a next step in your life of following after Jesus. That's really our goal this morning, uh, to provide all of us with a moment of intentionality. We're, of course, very busy people. It, it might be the most frequently mentioned comment was when I ask someone how they're doing. It used to be, how are you doing? I'm good. Some people still say they're good, but a lot of people say they're busy, and uh, I'm busy too. And it's important, I think, to have moments in life where you pause and you think intentionally at uh, you know, what you are about. Of course, we do this in our work world, but in our life of being a disciple of Jesus, we want to have that same kind of intentionality. Uh, Paul describes it simply this, this way, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. We want to think intentionally about how we are walking in Christ for this next year. Well, John 9 and Jesus' interaction with his disciples, with a man who has been born blind and who experiences a remarkable healing, and with Jesus' antagonists, all uh, reveal people making steps forward and backwards with regard to Jesus, moving more closely towards or further away from Jesus. And John tells us at the end of his gospel, his purpose for writing this gospel, so that we might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing we may have life in his name. And that means, among other things, that this story is an invitation for us to learn about who Jesus is for the first time or for the next time. Uh, and to take steps after him. And so what I'm going to do this morning, a little bit different than what we typically do, is I'm going to read the story, and I'm going to note along the way steps forward and backward, and then at the end, I'll call each of us to a few specific applications, rather than reading all 41 verses at the beginning. So uh, we can enter into John's report in verse 1, as he, Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, that might sound initially as a harsh question. Uh, you know, and as frequently as I've read the story, I thought, oh, that's, that's kind of an intense question. You're walking by this man with a a uh, disability from birth, and uh, you want to try to assign some kind of blame to uh, this outcome the disciples do. But if we're honest, if we spend enough time over the course of our lives in, let's say, emergency rooms, hospital rooms, hospice rooms, you will hear or you will ask a version of this question. Whose fault is this tragedy? Did this horrible thing happen because of something I did? Did this happen because of something that someone else did? And we know that sometimes in life, uh, perhaps after a crime has been committed, there is someone to blame. But sometimes the answer is just simply and mysteriously that in a sin-impacted world, our bodies pay the price. That sin impacts our physicality. It's not the blind man's fault. It's not the cancer patient's fault. 
But the disciples, I think, are taking a step here. This time through, I, I heard their question differently. Rather than hearing it harshly, uh, the way that I heard it was them trusting Jesus enough to ask a hard question about the way life is. Jesus, why is, why is life this way? Why this man? Why this disability? Why is life the way that it is? It's a step towards Jesus, I think. Trusting Jesus enough with a hard question about the way life is. And Jesus answers, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So we need to ask right away, what are the works of God? What might Jesus uh, intend to display in his interaction with this man? What might he intend to display for his disciples? Well, let's think just briefly about what, what are the works of God? What's the first work of God? Creation. Creation is the first work of God. What's the next work of God? Trick question. Like, I didn't know there was going to be a quiz today. I thought there was just going to be lunch, you know, the worship <laughs> lunch. I didn't know there was going to be an exam. So, so creation and then providence, how God rules over his creation, either directly or indirectly, how he provides, how he rules all things for his purposes, and of course, thirdly, salvation is God's work. So creation, rule, providence, redemption, salvation, putting the world right, restoration. These are all works of God. And then Jesus invites his disciples to take a next step. Did you see uh, the next step that he invites them to take in the end of verse 3, the beginning of verse 4? We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So he invites his disciples into the work that he is doing. It's like there is a step that the disciples can take. He invites them in. And having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. That is interesting. This, this time through the story, I thought, I, I thought for a moment, why did John take the time to explain the meaning of the name of the pool? Right? He's writing the story. He's the author. He can make the choices about what to include. Why does he include the translation of the name? Why do you think he includes the translation of the name? He sends them to the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Well, I, I came up with two theories. Here's, here's my first theory. This man can't see Jesus. He can hear Jesus. He can feel Jesus. He can feel Jesus touch him. He can feel the mud on his eyes, he can obey Jesus by doing what he hears Jesus tell him to do. And what Jesus tells him to do is to go. Jesus sends him. And so I think the, the name is an interpretive clue for this man. He is one whom Jesus sends. He goes where he sends is sent. And this is really a, a next step for the man, isn't he? That, that Jesus, who he knows a little bit about, Jesus, who maybe he's heard about, Jesus, whose voice he's now heard, tells him to do something. And his first step is to go where Jesus sends him just because Jesus says so. I mean, it's, it is curious, right? I mean, Jesus makes mud and puts it on his eyes. I mean, that's potentially weird. I think there's, there's something else that's being symbolized there. I don't think the man at this point can completely track the symbol. But if you think in the Bible, 
about the works of God and the making of mud and the fashioning of it and the forming of it, what does it remind you of? Creation. This man, though he doesn't know it, is having an encounter with the Creator. And the Creator tells him to go and do something. And so he goes and he does it. He went. He was sent and then he went and he washed and he came back seeing. And everybody was thrilled. (laughs) Nobody was thrilled. If you've read this story before, the, the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. How many people could have looked like him, you wonder? Uh, He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. I don't know if these are the worst neighbors ever. (laughs) But they're not great. In verses 13 to 14, the confusion shifts from where is Jesus, we can't find him, to who is Jesus. They don't get Jesus. So uh, they bring in the Pharisees which is a a minor key moment in the story. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. So if you're new to the story, if you're new to the Bible, maybe you're hearing this strange encounter between Jesus and the man in John 9 for the first time. Uh, What you need to know is the Pharisees were like spiritual influencers. Uh, They weren't a formal uh, group of people. They weren't priests necessarily. Uh, but they were people, men in particular, who had dedicated themselves to living with a particular strictness of uh, religious performance. They were influencers. They were uh, well regarded in the culture. They're also feuding with Jesus. By this point in John's gospel, uh, they are uh, they're on speaking terms, but their words aren't great back and forth between each other. Jesus is saying things like, I am the light of the world, John 8 and verse 12. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And the Pharisees have been answering with words like, nah. <laughs> you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Because anybody can say anything about themselves, right? That's what they're saying. You know, I'm an Olympic track athlete. And you would say, nah. (laughs) And you would be right. Jesus tells them they're wrong. Verse 16, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. Now, this is a remarkable thing that Jesus is saying. You could have an entire sermon on this verse. Jesus is equating himself in equality to God the Father, but he's distinguishing himself as a person unique from the Father. So there is something deeply theological that's happening here, And the the Pharisees are savvy at least to a little bit of it. And they respond with super kind words questioning Jesus' parentage. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? I think there was probably an edge in that. And Jesus answered them with non-controversial irony words, like, you neither know me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. 
These words he spoke in the treasure as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So Jesus and the Pharisees are having this tense interaction where the, the more the Pharisees think they understand what Jesus is saying, the less they like what Jesus is saying about himself. And now, back into our story, Jesus' antagonists are looking at this man. And, and we come to what will be the principal point of contention in verse 14. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. There is a step backwards here that the Pharisees are making. How would you describe it? How would you describe the step backwards that they are making? One way to describe it is they are assessing Jesus through the grid of their preconceptions. They are assessing Jesus through their own rules of interpretation that Jesus must fit their idea of who Jesus must be. That, that they're certain about who Jesus is and who isn't. And their certainty, their bad preconceptions, are causing them to not have to deal with Jesus. If you can explain away Jesus, you think you don't have to deal with Jesus. They're taking a step backwards. But others in the conversation, make a better step. How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? In a world marked by doubt and unbelief, it's a step forward to at least remain open to Jesus. The, the, this, this segment of people in the conversation are, are at least open to learning more, so we want to commend that. And maybe that's you this morning. Maybe uh, you've had Jesus in your grid of preconception, but you want to at least be open to who he is. There was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. In the Old Testament, the prophets like Elijah and Elisha were notable miracle workers. Both Elijah and Elisha each raised boys from the dead. And so I think the healed man here is taking a step, that, that he's willing at this point to put Jesus into the highest category of person that he can think of. That he's willing to extend to Jesus kind of the, the, the maximum consideration that he is possibly willing to extend at this point in his understanding. The greatest person that he can think of is miracle-performing prophet. That's Jesus. Well, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight. And this is a step backwards. To see evidence of Jesus' work and to disbelieve it. So they didn't believe that he had been born blind until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. And then John provides the explanatory comment, another important parenthesis. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews by which John means the religious leadership. For the Jews, the religious leadership had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Messiah, 
he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Which direction do the parents step in? Well, they take a step back, don't they? Why do they take the step back? Well, because they're afraid, but, but what are they afraid of? I would suspect in a room with this number of people, some of you can identify with their fear because some of you work in places. Some of you belong to families. Some of you are on teams where being identified with Jesus is risky. The synagogue was, of course, the local place of worship, but it was also the key community gathering point. It was where you really needed to belong to in order to be part of the community life of your town, your village, your area. And being put out of the synagogue didn't mean just that you could go down the street and find another one, that you could go to the second synagogue of Cana. Being put out meant being shunned, losing your place of worship and your place in the community, which everybody would know about. It wasn't like they were just going to send them a letter saying, we wish you would go to the synagogue in Capernaum. No, everybody would know that they weren't welcome. There was a steep cost, and they're not willing to pay it. So they take a step backwards from associating with Jesus. The parents do. So for the second time now, the leadership calls the man who had been born blind. And they said to him, give glory to God, which is, uh, in essence, putting him under oath. Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. This is our preconception of Jesus. He's a sinner which is a step backwards for the religious leadership. They're doubling down on their unbelief. And the healed man answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And our friend, perhaps becoming impatient, Answer them, I've told you already, and you would not listen. And here's where our, my heart really warms up to this guy. <laughs> Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And this word also is key, uh, that, that the man is taking another step forward, that he's publicly identifying with Jesus at the very moment that his parents are publicly distancing themselves from Jesus, that he is aware of the cost of identifying with Jesus, and he's putting himself out there. And uh, his expectations for poor treatment are met. Verse 28, they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. They don't know his lineage. They don't know his origin. They don't know his legitimacy. The man, the man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began another point at creation, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Notice how the man connects the first work of God, creation, never since the world began with what Jesus has done. This is a healing story. It's a recreating story. There had been no sight. And Jesus does the creating work of God. And the man steps forward. He is in the story believing more and more about Jesus as the words pass by. He's come to sight and he's coming to sight. His eyes were physically opened and his eyes are being spiritually opened. They 
answered him with encouraging words, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. They think they're taking a step forward in following God. But they're really taking a step backwards, aren't they? They're disassociating from someone in whom Jesus has worked in such a powerful way that this man can bear witness to God's own creating power in this man, Jesus from Nazareth. And they're disassociating themselves from someone who can bear witness to Jesus as the light. They put him out. You're with Jesus. We can't be with you. But what they've really done is they've put themselves out. It is ironic, and I think we're supposed to feel the irony, that they put the man out of their community, but really they've put themselves out of the community of faith. They've put themselves out of the community who can point people to Jesus, the community that Jesus is building. They stepped backwards. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Well, here is the man's final next step. And this might be a next step that some of you need to take this morning. The man worships the true Jesus as Jesus reveals himself to be. Son of man uh, does not mean simply human. Uh, For many years, I I read the Bible and thought that's what the designator son of man meant, that Jesus is speaking to his humanity. What Jesus is doing is he's connecting himself to a figure that we meet in the Old Testament. In Daniel's prophecy in chapter uh, 7, Daniel is given a glimpse. There came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days. So this one, like a son of man, is brought to the throne of thrones, to the Ancient of Days, and is presented before him. And to him, to the son of man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. That's the son of man. And in John's gospel, up to this point, Jesus has said in several different places that he is the Son of Man. For instance, in John 1, he is the Son of Man on whom the angels ascend and descend. In other words, Jesus is invoking this image from the Old Testament, from uh, the original stairway to heaven. And he's saying, I am the portal to the presence of God. I am the Son of Man. In John 3, Jesus says that the Son of Man will be lifted up on the cross so that all who are perishing, uh, who look to Him in faith, will be saved. Again, drawing on the Old Testament account where uh, God tells Moses to fashion a bronze serpent and put it on a pole so that all of the afflicted Israelites who look at the lifted up pole uh, in faith will be healed from their infirmity, which they brought on themselves. And Jesus says, I I will be the one who will be lifted up on the cross and I will heal the infirmities of those who look on me in faith. Though they bring it on themselves, the Son of Man will be lifted up and life will entail to those who believe. And in John 5, He is the Son of Man who has the authority to judge. In John 6, He is the Son of Man who gives eternal life. And in John 8, He is the Son of Man who acts with the authority of the Father in heaven. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is He, sir, that I might believe in Him? Who is He, sir, that I might believe in the One who is the portal to heaven? Who is He, sir, that I might believe in the one who will be lifted up for my infirmity? Who is He, sir, who has the authority to judge? Who is He, sir, who has the authority to give eternal life? Who is He, sir, who acts with the authority of heaven? Who is He, sir? Jesus says, you have seen Him. And it is He who is speaking to you. Don't miss the artistry of the story. You couldn't see, but that, now you heard. And I sent you. But now you see and you hear. 
Do you see, loved one, and do you hear? He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Here's the final next step, to worship Jesus as Jesus shows himself to be. Not the Jesus of our preconceptions, not the Jesus that fits our narratives, not the Jesus who necessarily makes following him easier, but the Jesus who's worth following. For as Jesus says in verse 39, for judgment I come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. Who sinned? This man or his parents? That he was born blind. The disciples asked. Jesus said, if you were blind, you'd have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. So the man takes the final step forward. The Pharisees here are taking a final step backwards. If you think you see who Jesus is and you assess him through your own grid, perhaps because you're afraid of influencers in your life, perhaps because you're afraid of the cost, if you keep doubling down on your unbelief, if you disassociate from the people in whom Jesus is working, if you distance yourself from those whom Jesus is saying, if you say, I can't be around you because you're with Jesus, Jesus says your guilt remains. Don't take that step this morning. Because if you take that step, you're not stepping forward. You're stuck. So what steps might we take this morning? Well, Jesus trusted his disciples to be with him, and the disciples trusted Jesus enough to ask him hard questions about why life is the way life is. Maybe that's a step you need to take this morning. Maybe you need to be willing to ask Jesus your hard questions. Maybe you need to put them on the table so that they don't stay buried in your heart, fermenting and fomenting unbelief. In a world of doubt and unbelief, maybe you need to take the step of staying open to learning more about who Jesus is. Maybe you're a follower of Jesus and you need to be encouraged to go where Jesus sends you. That where you, when you go to work or class or to your teams, that you go with someone who's sent. Maybe you need to take the step of publicly identifying with Jesus. Maybe you need to do that in a formal way. Maybe it's time to get baptized and to nail your flag to the mast, and to say, I'm with Jesus. And I don't care who knows, but I would that everyone knows. Maybe it's time to formally associate with the community of the people that Jesus is saving. Maybe it's time to worship Jesus as He says He is, whether it will make your life easier or harder, and probably every Christian in this room will tell you it will do both. <laughs> it will make your life easier, and it will make your life harder. I wondered, and I mentioned this at the beginning of the sermon, why John took the time to explain the meaning of the word siloam, sent. I said that I had two theories. I only told you one, for those of you keeping score. You're like, this is a horrible sermon. He only told me one of his theories. Well, the first reason, I think, is to highlight that the man is willing to go where Jesus sends him. But I think the second reason is wrapped into Jesus' invitation to his disciples. And here's where we'll end on Next Step Sunday. That Jesus wants his disciples to live like sent people. That he wants them to join him in doing God's work. We must do the works of him who sent me, which Jesus reiterates uh, after his death and resurrection in John 20, where he says to the disciples, and then on to the church down to today, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so even I am sending you. Saloa means sent. Disciples are sent by Jesus into the world 
to do His works. What works? Well, some works only Jesus can do. Only Jesus can create from nothing. Only Jesus can die on the cross for us. But writ large, we see more of His works in this story that we can engage in. Works of compassion, works of mercy, works of witness, works of building community, works of being brave, works of encouraging each other, works of identifying with Jesus, no matter who is looking. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So maybe for many of us, the bottom line question is, where is Jesus sending you today? Where is He sending you today? We're going to provide an opportunity for you to reflect on that. And it's a serious question because throughout this story, we see people taking steps forward and we see people taking steps backwards. And what we discover is we're doing one or the other, but neutrality is not an option. 